right, it's Matt, and I'm back. That camera decided to turn off again, and I would like to say thank you, camera, for reminding me I'm not in control. And I'm angry because of it. So, we were talking about processing. So, it's my belief that if I have to use exercise, running, Tai Chi, as a form of expression, but I'm not processing it, I can become enslaved to that form of expression, even if it has health benefits to it. Understand where I'm going with this. So let's say, okay, I'm 37 right now. The only way I express my anger is through exercise and through running. And it's the, the, the best way I can deal with it now. So I'm not processing it, I'm just expressing it. So I do that as opposed to going home or going to work uh, and expressing my anger. And it's kept me out of a lot of trouble, we'll say. Okay? But have I processed it? So now at 37, I can work out and run. Now what happens though, if I get an injury and I cannot run anymore and I cannot work out for three months? Does that mean my anger goes away too? No. Does that mean that now somehow I'm gonna magically possess skills to process anger? No. So now the only two ways that I have available to me, <clears throat> excuse me, the only two ways I have available to me to express my anger have been taken away because of an injury. For the next three months, what do I do with my anger if I haven't learned to process it? Now let's fast forward. 37, I can do it. When I'm 77, I might still have just as much anger, but if I can't work out and run when I'm 77 because I'm 77, what do I do then with my anger? So you see the problem here with expression without processing. It's not to say that you can't use activities to help. There is a whole biochemical component to exercise and Tai Chi and all that. That's great stuff. I'm not saying you gotta toss that to the side. I'm just saying if that's the only thing we use and we're not processing, what's the problem with that? So, last question on section two. What might I be doing differently in my life if I wasn't feeling ashamed of my shame or afraid of my fear? So how would life be different if you were able to just experience your shame and just experience your fear? I invite you to ask that question and really sit with yourself on that one, chew on it, and see what that tastes like. That's a very interesting question for me to ask myself. So. Let's move on to section three, belief. So I'm really excited about this section. So, so far we have talked about behavior modification. We've gone through some important skills, but again, it's just behavior we're talking about. We still have this underlying belief on anger that we haven't addressed, but that's what we're doing now. So if section two was behavior modification, section three is belief recreation, okay? So belief recreation. So let's read this first paragraph here. If it is true that behavior is only a symptom of belief that we have created, what might happen if we stop short of addressing those beliefs? So what happens if we end the program here? What happens if, if all you learn from this is a few skills how to uh, respond a bit better? What happens? I've given you some tools, and I think they're pretty good tools. I think they're important tools. I think out of all the tools there, I like these tools the best for me that we've gone through, or else I wouldn't have put them in this program. It works for me. But what happens if we don't find out what's really driving your shame and fear? That is the root cause for me. I wonder what the root cause is for your anger. What happens if we don't get down there? What happens if we turn the video off right now? What happens if we end the program? Hmm. Where do these beliefs come from? And could they point to the source of our anger? I believe that answer is yes. This shame and fear points to the source of our anger. It is my opinion that to stop short of, at this point may offer us some temporary relief, but not much healing. We can have a sense of relief. Again, take the, the, the anger Advil but is it true healing? 
It hasn't been for me until I get into this kind of stuff that we're going to get into. So, imagine walking around with a small rock in your shoe. We're going to use this as an analogy. So, you're walking around, you got a small rock in your shoe. Relief is like sitting down. While you're seated, the pain is gone. But you are no longer moving forward on your journey. So, ah, 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 each step, I got that little pebble. So, I sit down. Oh, well, that feels better. Cool. The pain is gone. I've healed. Ah, uh, wait a second. Have you really fixed the cause of the pain? Just because you're not experiencing it in this moment, does that necessarily indicate that the pain is gone? Does sitting down indicate that the pebble is out of your shoe? No. In fact, it would indicate that the pebble is still there. It would only indicate that the pain is no longer present. But you're also not moving forward. There's no growth. The journey has stopped. If you would like to continue the growth, if you would like to continue the journey, we're going to have to address that pebble. You can sit down the rest of your life if you like to. You can take a seat and take yourself out of the game and just experience relief if you want to and never deal with the pebble. That's your choice. That's my choice too if I choose to. But it's important for me to point out in my belief that is just relief. So healing is like taking the rock out of the shoe. You are now able to continue your journey. Both acknowledge the pain, both acknowledging the pain uh, and making an attempt to address the pain. When we do that, when we uh, acknowledge the pain and address the pain, we're uh, respecting the purpose of the pain enough to interact with it. So let me, I wrote that sentence a bit awkward there. When I acknowledge the pain and I say, there's a rock in my shoe. Well, that's what we did with relief. You sat down because of the acknowledgement. If I acknowledge it, but I also address it, I'm respecting that pain enough to have some sort of interaction with it. Sometimes you got to bend over, take off the shoe, dig your finger in there and pick it up and get that pebble out. It might be a little tougher than just sitting down. It might take a little bit more work, but it comes to the question, do you want relief or do you want healing? The choice is yours, the choice is all of ours on what we wanna do. And at each stage, we always have an opportunity. Do I wanna go, con do I wanna continue in this healing process or do I wanna just take a seat and find some temporary relief? Temporary relief could last a lifetime, but again, uh, I would argue, or I would encourage uh, you to think of it as um, it's not true healing. Anyways, so let's go into step one. Step one is what's called the literal. What are you angry about? Literally, I left a line there. Pick anything. Pick something current. Pick something in the past. What are you angry about? I'm angry that this guy cut me off. I'm angry that my wife didn't do, I'm angry my husband didn't do, whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you put down, anything. Again, don't overthink some of these. Let's go through my example. My example is, we'll say this is a wife talking to her husband or talking about her husband. He told me he would take the trash out. What are you angry about? He told me he would take the trash out. He didn't take it out. Okay, perfect. We're in the literal. And it's my opinion that most things when dealing with either anger or dealing with goals, dealing with our self-sabotage and our success, hang out in the literal. They, they live in the literal. They never get any further. Oh, what is it you want? You want to earn this much money? Well, let's just stay in the literal and just hang out right here. Let's not go any deeper. Oh, what are you angry about? Oh, let's just hang out right here. What if this is true? We are never angry about what we say we're angry about. So when you say, I'm angry about A, it's not A you're angry about. If you say, I'm angry about A, B, and C, that's not it either. There's something deeper down. So let's take the next step. We're going to go in the symbolic realm or area next. The main question for that, the main questions of these steps are in black here. What does that really mean to you? So, Mrs. So-and-so, you told me you're literally mad that he did not take out the trash. I'm curious, what does that really mean to you? What does it mean that he didn't do it? 
And if she were to sit and think about that for a second, she might have a response like this. He didn't keep his promise to me. Perfect. What we're doing now is a huge, huge step. It might not seem that important. But if I can project, this is huge. What we've done is we've stepped out of the literal. So already we can see that Mrs. So-and-so is not angry about a bag of trash that has not been taken out. It's not why she's mad. That's not why she's withholding her love. That's not why she's going into angry outburst over a bag of trash. A deeper meaning is that her husband did not keep his promise to her. Ah, now we're getting a bit deeper. Can we take it a bit deeper? In most cases, you will be able to. You will be able to ask again, what does that mean? In some cases, some people will just kind of stop and, well, uh, you'll know when you're done asking that question. But let's continue. So let's say we say, okay, Mrs. So-and-so, and what would that mean? You just said that he didn't um, keep his promise to you. What would that mean? She might say, well, that means he doesn't respect my needs or wants. Ah. You see how we're getting deeper now with Mrs. So-and-so? Now we're figuring out she's really not angry about trash. She's really not angry about some promise. Now what she's saying, she's angry because she didn't feel respected. Ah. Now we're really getting someone. So what if we were to ask that question one more time? And, and again, you could ask this question 20 times and get deep and deep and deep. At some point, as we'll talk about, you're at the end. So, he didn't respect you. What does that mean? It means he doesn't value me. Let's just stop for a second. Consider what she just said. She feels unvalued. That's what has made her angry. Or I should say that's what's a deeper root to her anger is not feeling valued. Not a bag of trash. I mean, really? Think back to most of the things that you get angry about. I mean, really? Is it that? Is it really some guy cut you off? Is it really some guy didn't turn his blinker on? Is it really your, your husband said he would bring this home? Is it really your wife didn't have this done on time? Or is it really that your kid, you know, got a C plus? Is that real? I mean, really? Is that what you're really angry about? Or is there something deeper to it? We will never figure that out unless we ask these questions. If we stay stuck in the literal, you're there forever. You're stuck in the literal. You're going to be a dog chasing your tail in the literal realm. You will literally be like a dog chasing its tail if you stay in the literal and always go, no, I'm really mad about this. I would offer you this. You're not. I could be wrong, but I would say my guess is you're not. So let's turn the page. This question of what would that mean to you could be asked many times until two things. One, the person is not willing or not able to go deeper. At some point, you're not, nah, I don't, I, that's it. I don't want to answer that question anymore. You might be digging a little too deep. And, and this means with yourself too. You might be asking, uh, and you might be unable to answer. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'll offer you this though. If you're not at least able to answer that question at least once, if you can't take the literal and ask once what that would mean to you in the symbolic, you might be very shut down emotionally because now you, you are not letting yourself get out of the literal. You're stuck. If you can at least answer that question once, I'm telling you, you've made it. You've made it into the symbolic realm. How deep you go is up to you. Or two, there might be another reason why we can't ask the question anymore. We've come to the final source. We've come to the end. It's shame or fear. We've already kind of done that with her. She told me she didn't feel valued. Well, what's the opposite of feeling valued? It's unvalued, which is shame. So she's telling me, I felt shame that he didn't take the trash out. Wow. That's what it really is for her. She felt shame. Not a bag of trash being taken out. Right? In this example, the person with anger is really angry because they feel unvalued by the other. It has nothing to do with the bag of trash being taken out or not. The behavior of the other acted as a reflection to the repressed pain of feeling ashamed or afraid earlier in life. Could that be true? Let me say that in other words. 
the behavior of the husband reminded her of pain that she has stuffed and not dealt with. This guy's not taking out the trash was a convenient mirror for her to look at and recall, oh yeah, there's a lot of shame and fear from years and years and years ago, before this marriage, before this relationship, decades earlier. This little incident just triggered that, reminded me of it. That shame and fear from a long time ago is very, very painful to address. So I will project it onto him now and get angry because of a bag of trash and not let him off the hook. You promise, blah, 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 blah. Really? So, I think that might be true. There's, there's deeper things from earlier in life. And when I mean earlier in life, I mean earlier in childhood. We're talking about belief systems that you have of yourself, okay? how you view yourself. Now, psychologists will say that about 90% of your beliefs, 90% of your belief system and your value system is set in stone, meaning it's kind of formed by the age of seven. So who you think you are, your values, your worldview is, is typed on paper by the age of seven. Doesn't mean that you cannot change that. But if we have not taken a look at our belief system, if we have not taken a look at our value system, more than likely you have a 9 out of 10 chance that whatever you believe or whatever value you have about yourself, has you've been doing it for a very, very long time. The same is true with shame and fear. When you have a trigger of shame and fear, my guess would be this. It's a trigger from something that happened probably earlier than 7, maybe even younger still than that. But it's a long time ago. And this is why in this approach to dealing with anger, it gets deep. And it's my opinion, this is why most programs to anger will not go here. This is uncomfortable, uncharted territory. Um, some of you uh, might like to turn this off right now. Some of you might not be listening at this point. You might be hearing a few words. I understand that. I have been there. But I can only offer you this truth for me. If we don't continue into the third and fourth step of this process, we are enslaved to having to modify our behavior because we haven't gotten to the source yet. So if you can stick with me, I honor your courage to stick with me in this process. So, step three, the paradoxical. Now we're getting a bit deeper. There's two main questions in the paradoxical. A, could it be true that you are really angry with yourself for everything mentioned above at the other? So could it be true that everything she said, well, I'm angry that this, this, and this, it's really her that she's angry about. L let me give you an example. So she said, I'm angry that he doesn't keep his promises to me. What if we took that and wrote it out and then put an S right on the front of he. He said, are you really angry that he doesn't keep his promises to you? Or that you don't keep your promises to you? So Mrs. So-and-so, are you mad that there's promises that you make to yourself that you don't keep? You tell yourself, oh, I'm going to do this, and you don't do it. And instead of acknowledging that, it's easier to be angry at him for his lack of following through with his promises. Now, it doesn't mean that it's okay for someone to make a promise to you and not follow through with it, but understand the point. She's not really angry at his lack of following through. She's angry at her lack of following through in herself. But it's easier to project it. Then she said, well, he doesn't respect me. Okay, take the he, put an S on it. Aren't you really mad that you don't respect you? Do you respect you? Well, no. And that probably makes you pretty mad. But see, that anger is harder to deal with. You not respecting you, that's sensitive stuff. Ooh. It's easier to say, you don't respect me, as opposed to going, oh, yeah, I don't respect me either, and that's more painful. And last one, she said, hey, he doesn't value me. Could it be true that you don't value you? So you see what we've taken with that list, whatever it means to you? 
could you put your name on that? Could you own that and go, yeah, I don't really keep my own promises to myself. Uh, I don't respect myself and I don't value myself at times, right? I'm not saying your entire life is, is summed up by this, but there's at times I do that. I know this is true for me. Hey, there's times I don't keep my promises to myself. That makes me mad. It's easier to, to, to be mad at someone else though. There's times I don't respect myself and there's times I don't value myself. So might all this be true of, of our example person? So could Mrs. So-and-so, could this be true for her? And might that be true for you if you placed yourself in this anger model? If you dove in and filled out those blanks, could that be true for you? And can you really be angry at anyone else? Is it possible to really be mad at anybody else? Because it's really you that you're angry with, isn't it? And isn't that's the paradox. We think we're angry at someone else, but it's really us we're angry with. So I wonder if that's true for you. It's true for me. I like to think that I'm angry at somebody else, but when I go through this step, this model, with myself, yeah, oh yeah, it's not really that or this, it's, it's me. Everyone is just acting as a mirror for me. Thank you for reminding me I got, I got some stuff to heal from. Cool. I'm going to go back to that appreciation. I'm going to try to appreciate this. It has nothing to do with you. There's a second question, the paradoxical. Could it be true that all anger points to and is reflective of the shame and fear we experienced a very long time ago? So let's say Mrs. So-and-so, when her husband didn't take the trash out, she was cursing and yelling and just livid. You mean to tell me she got that mad over a bag of trash? Think about some domestic uh, violence things. Go watch the, what's that show, Cops. I mean, my God. The things that people do to each other, uh, pulling guns and knives on one another, these domestic, domestic disputes. And you find out it was something like he didn't turn the lights off. I mean, really? You were going to kill this person. You were going to shoot this person because he didn't turn the lights off? Are you kidding me? If you want to get stuck in the literal, go, yeah, I'm mad because that electricity bill is getting high. That's not it. There's something that happened to you along, and even if he repeated, let's say, well, he always turns off. And let's say that might even be true. He always leaves the lights on. That's still, that's what's happening today. It's reflective of what's happening in the past. So could all the shame and fear that we're experiencing have happened a long time ago? Let's ask a few deep and questions, deep questions. And if you can hang in there with me and stick with me, let's ask some of these questions. When was the first time in your life you felt unvalued? Take a moment, pause the video if you need to. When was the first time you felt, I am not valued? The first memory you have, four, five, six, maybe even earlier, maybe a little bit later. What's the first memory you can recall? How old were you? Can you put a number on that? Can you tell me, oh, it was, it was this age. Was it a specific event that happened? Was it a general theme going on in your life? Next question, leading down from these, the, the first two questions. Who was it that you felt unvalued by? Was it a specific person? Who was that? Did they tell you you were unvalued? Did their behavior and treatment of you tell you that you don't matter? Did they abuse you in some way? showing you your boundaries don't matter what you want doesn't matter were you not allowed to have a voice your voice doesn't matter did you try to express something to to an adult and they didn't believe you you don't matter if you're able to answer that question good if not let me ask another question did you feel, when you were a child, did you feel valued by your father? Did his treatment of you, his behavior towards you, his words towards you, did it say, I value you as a unique individual, or did it not? Would the same be true of your mother? In your experience of your mother in childhood, did her words, her behavior, her actions all indicate, hey, you matter, or was it, you don't matter? And there might have been pockets where you felt like you mattered and pockets you didn't. We're trying to find that, that first 
if you can recall that first time where you felt I didn't matter, when, how old, who was it by, are you able to, to answer these questions? Again, I honor the courage to, to listen to these questions and, and the even more courage it takes to answer these questions. So, if you can recall those questions and, and answer those in your head, my next question is, how did that feel? How did that feel to not be valued? And how did you react? What did you do? Can we reflect back on those four Fs? What happened? Could it be true that most, if, if not all, reactions to anger originate here? So, you want to find a, a, an a, a original source of your anger? We're just discussing it. That experience of four years old and not feel, feeling valued by dad or whatever it is, that's your source of anger. That's where the belief is on anger that we need to, to, to look to. This is why you will continue to react in anger in this specific way, in this specific situation, because of what happened a long time ago. If we don't address this and only address behavior, you better do a darn good job of keeping a, a tight rein on your behavior. But if we can deal with this belief, essentially we can change forever how you react to anger because we're dealing with the root cause. You can still have those tools to deal with behavior, but we've gotten in there on the belief. Could it be true that a reaction in anger today is the aftertaste or reminder of anger within us that has been suppressed or repressed. So, could it be true that any anger I have today is just an aftertaste of what happened earlier in life? If this is true, if this all this is true, that this anger, this shame and fear from childhood is the root cause of anger today in adulthood, what do we do with it now? What do we do? Step four, the creative. So let me ask you a question, going back to whatever this age was, whatever thing happened, whatever that person was, if you can recall that, let me ask you a question. What did you want to hear most as a child, as this child in this incident at, at this age? What did you want to hear most from the person with whom you felt unvalued or unsafe? So, if you were four years old and felt unvalued by your dad. What did four-year-old you want to hear most from your father? Would you be able, are you willing to take a moment and think about what did four-year-old, five-year-old, whatever it is, what did you want to hear most from this person, from your father, from your mother? Take some time to think about it. Write it down even. Here's an example if you're having a hard time with this. Perhaps you wanted to hear this. You matter to me. Or maybe you wanted to hear, I will keep you safe as best that I can. Maybe that's what you wanted to hear. You just wanted to know that you matter and you just wanted to know that you were safe. But you wanted to hear it from this person. So. Here's what we're getting into now, is we're doing what's called reparenting ourselves and reparenting this part, these parts of us. So follow me on this, if you, if you will. There is an inner child to us, there is a part to us that wasn't parented, wasn't treated, and didn't experience what he or she wanted to experience. They've been angry for a long time that they haven't been able to experience what they wanted to experience. They weren't parented the way they needed it, okay? Um, there's a lot of shame and fear in this, this inner child. So now that we've addressed this inner child, we've acknowledged it. There's an inner child in there that's hurt. We have to respect this child now by parenting this child. So now this child can't go back to its biological father or biological mother or, or whomever it was. Even if those people are still alive, we can't go back to them. We can't, those people can't parent us or reparent re us. What did or didn't happen, did or didn't happen. What if it's true that it's our job, the self of today, it's our job to reparent those parts to us? I think that's true. So, again, 
What did you want to hear most from that person who made you feel unsafe or unvalued? What is that? Could you, would you, say that to yourself right now? Let me help you with how that would work. You might say something like this. Four-year-old Matthew, this is your future self. I want you to know that you matter to me. I want you to know that I will keep you safe the best I can. I acknowledge your pain and I want to build a relationship with you and I want to connect with you and make you feel important enough that I acknowledge you and important enough that I respect you and give you the attention that you need as I'm doing now. And there's a whole lot of other different scripts and things you can use, but what if just saying some words like that and actually speaking to yourself and speaking out loud? Would you be willing to consider that? And I'm curious, if this is hard to do, I'm wondering why it would be hard to do. Why would it be hard to do to say those words to yourself? Little Matthew, this is Big Matt. I want to tell you, you matter. Why might those words be hard to say? That always has interested me when I'm looking at myself. I find the things that are the most uncomfortable to do and the most challenging to do are the most rewarding and usually in this type of stuff, they're the most empowering and the most healing. If it was easy, everyone would do it and there'd be no anger in the world, in my opinion. So. What we're doing now is we are creating, quote unquote, um, reparenting, new experience about the past, which can create new ways in which we react and respond to anger. There are parts in us that are wounded and need healing. That wound may just need to be acknowledged. It just might want to go, hey, I'm hurting right now and I have been for a long time. It might need to be respected. I want to hear and know that my current self will value me and keep me safe. These parts to us, our inner child, has most likely have been wounded, and it, it is our role, I believe, to reparent them today. So even if you can't say those words, it's okay. We've begun the process of acknowledgement. If you're still with me, if you're still here, we have at least acknowledged. If you're unable to say those words, I respect that, and I totally understand that. Perhaps in the future you will be able to. So please note, work in this area of our inner parts are profoundly deep and unique. You're probably sensing how deep this work 